Okay, so today we're going to explore the idea of exponential objects. Now, this is really one of the most profound ideas in category theory because it really gives us this kind of fundamental connection between the specific and the general. So, basically, if you have a category, you've got lots of things going on, lots of objects and lots of arrows. But what you can do is, if you have exponential objects, you can kind of take some of those relationships and that are kind of happening externally to a particular object and they can be internalized, okay? So just like our brains are in the world, but we have a kind of representation of what's going on in the world inside our brains, in a similar way, you can have a sort of one of these exponential objects in a category and it kind of, in a sense, understands things about the relationship between other objects outside of itself. So in particular, an exponential object uh, basically encodes the kind of collection of arrows from one object to another. But just to say that is not enough. There's a lot more going on than just that. So perhaps the easiest scenario to understand about exponential objects is this category of sets. So think about the set of functions from set A to set B. That is an exponential object. But, and I mean, that's already quite a profound idea. If you think about things like lambda calculus and different things to do with computer science, you'll realize that um, just that idea of having exponential objects in the category of sets, of being able to sort of use a set to refer to all of the functions from one set to another, that idea is already very profound, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg as far as exponential objects go. There are many exponential objects in other categories which also have other interpretations and they're often a lot, lot more kind of complicated and interesting. So for example, you can have a exponential graph that kind of encodes all of the transformations from one graph to another graph. And it does more besides, it has a very kind of intricate structure. Um, what's perhaps most interesting is what exponential objects are in this category of categories. Uh, so just before I go on to introduce that, I just want to say another great thing about exponential objects is just is not just kind of what they are, but what they imply. Because the fact that all of these kind of relationships in the category are kind of internalized in these exponential objects really has profound implications for the sort of structure of the category itself. And so just from a kind of existential point of view, just knowing that you have exponential objects allows you to do a lot more reasoning and sort of deduce a lot more about the category itself, okay? Um, okay, so what about the category of categories then? Remember that has, remember that that has these objects as categories and these arrows as functors and it has exponential objects. And those exponential objects are so interesting. Okay, so do you remember the um, category of graphs and the category of dynamical systems? And the category of functions, they're all exponential objects in the category of categories. Every one of these functor categories, this category of functors from a category C to a category D, that's a exponential object in this category of categories. And understanding that and understanding how that works and what the kind of evaluation arrow is and so on is just so interesting. I mean, it, it makes us be able to see things from a much more general viewpoint. So, I mean, it was already quite interesting when we found that there's just a single category that represents all of this going on in graph theory, for example. And, um, you know, we can think of that as a kind of object in this category of categories. But now we're really going to understand how that works and how there's so many more things like that. And also associated with that, object, that category of categories, there's a kind of, because it's an exponential object, there's a kind of evaluator arrow. And 
this evaluator arrow is so profound it, it kind of acts like an oracle that in some sense it seems to sort of know everything about graph theory it knows about how you can transform any graph into any other graph what the edge sets and vertex sets of all graphs are you just give that arrow the right inputs and it'll tell you um, all of these different things and we can make those things in general so we're really going to gain a lot of kind of um, interesting information in this video now um, in order to do the work with the category of categories, I'm introducing a different kind of way to look at the category of categories, which is basically um, using like fundamental kinds of categories, like the one with just one arrow and sort of functors from stuff like that, these kind of elementary particles in this category of categories, these elementary really small categories well the functors from those can kind of shine onto any big category of interest and pick out individual objects or arrows or represent what's happening with composition so we're going to get this sort of um, externalized view of what's going on in this category of categories and I think it's very useful it really simplifies um, our view of this category of categories. We don't have to worry about the intricacies of functors anymore. And we're going to be able to um, do things like understand what's the product of two categories very simply. Okay, so to begin, uh, firstly, the sunglasses. Uh, I've been having some kind of eye problems recently, so the sunglasses are sort of helping. Um, secondly, identity arrows. Normally, I've been denoting the identity arrow of object A as IDA. Uh, but now, and probably in the subsequent videos, I'm going to be using this notation instead. 1A, denoting the identity arrow of A. So, slight change in notation. So, this kind of picture at the top left is really... Um, the definition of the exponential object. So I'm going to build up to this more gradually, but just to say it quickly, the idea is that the exponential object is an object which we call b to the power of a, and that's denoting the sort of, it's like the kind of internalization of the structure representing all of the arrows from a to b, and together with this object, b to the power of a, we also need this evaluation arrow, e, which is an arrow from b to the power of a times a to b. And the property that this stuff has to satisfy is that for any arrow g from c times a to b, there has to exist a unique arrow, g bar, from c to b to the power of a, such that it makes this diagram commute, okay? So doing evaluation after g bar times one equals g. Now I'm going to go over this more gradually and build up some intuition. But firstly, I mean, if you look at this, there's quite some reliance on the idea of a categorical product and the sort of notions related to that. So. Let's talk about products again, just so that we know what we're talking about. So remember that the categorical product of A and B is an object that we call A times B, together with these projections P1 and P2, which has the special property that for any object H, which has an arrow F into A and an arrow G, into b we have that there exists this unique arrow f comma g which makes this diagram commute okay so p1 after f comma g equals f p2 after f comma g equals g now we have a nice way of representing this um, which i think might be new for this series and it's basically the idea of representing it like this Okay, so we have some expression 
and then this horizontal line and then another expression. And what we're really denoting here is that there's a sort of isomorphism at work, okay? It's telling us that we can convert between something like this and something like this or vice versa using a sort of isomorphism. So, I mean, basically, if we have any object H with an arrow F into A and an arrow G into B, then we can sort of use the universal property of this categorical product to find this sort of intermediary arrow F comma G, like so, which makes this diagram commute. On the other hand, if we have this, if we have this arrow F comma G from H to A times B, then we can do P1 after it to get F, or we can do P2 after it to get G. And so we can also go the other way around. So we have this kind of isomorphism. We can interchange between a sort of pair of arrows from an object, one into A, one into B, and this kind of paired arrow um, from our object to A times B. Okay, so while I'm talking about this, I just want to quickly recap a very useful result that has to do with dealing with these categorical products. And that is that, say we have another object, capital X, and we have an arrow, little x, which goes into H. And say we want to compose that with F comma G, okay? So of course we'd call that result f comma g after x. Notice that I'm not doing these little circles today to denote after. I think we're getting familiar enough to category theory with category theory that we don't need to write those all the time. Okay, so this just means f comma g after x. But the result that I want to get across is that this is equal to f after x comma g after x. So what I'm saying is that if we compose f after x, we get an arrow like this. And if we compose g after x, we get an arrow like this. And so the kind of intermediary arrow associated with that will be an arrow from capital X to A times B that we can call this Fx comma Gx. And that has to have the property that doing P1 after it gives us F of X and doing P2 after it gives us G of X. And the fact that this is a categorical product tells us there's only going to be one such arrow. But we can see that f comma g after x, this thing here, also has this property, right? Because doing p1 after it will give us f of x, which is what we want, okay? And similarly, doing P2 after it will give us G of X. So basically, these two things are equal. So that's one thing, that's a result that's going to come up again and again. It's actually a really useful thing to realize because if you just look at it algebraically, all it's saying is that we can shift this X inside the brackets. And so it means that one can manipulate these, the sort of algebra involving categorical products very easily. And also sometimes you might want to go the other way, taking a common X outside of the product. Okay, um, the other result that's gonna come in useful, I mean, notice up here, we have this sort of product of two arrows. So what does that mean? Well, basically the definition is here. Okay, so imagine a situation where we have a categorical product of A and B and a categorical product of A dash and B dash over here with these projections Q1 and Q2. 
And suppose we have an arrow F from A dash to A and an arrow G from B dash to B. So we could write F times G. But what does that mean? Well, what it basically means is this is the kind of paired arrow, the kind of intermediary arrow associated with these blue arrows. This one being F after Q1 and this one being G after Q2. So we can think of F times G as just being shorthand for F after Q1 comma G after Q2 where Q1 and Q2 are these projections associated with this categorical product A dash times B dash. Okay, so I think that's enough background. Now we can really introduce the idea of the exponential object. So to introduce it, let's think about something simple. Let's think about a calculator. Okay, so on a calculator, uh, you can um, press buttons to input numbers and then you can do operations on them. So I know that a lot of the operations you'll do on a calculator involve two inputs, right? Like plus or times. But there are also operations you can do on a calculator which just involve one input, okay? So I'm talking about things like squaring a number, doing the square root of a number, doing the log of a number. And that's a good place to start thinking about exponential objects. Because what have you got going on there? I mean, um, let's say you have this set C of operations, which are like that so-called unitary operations, things that just take one input, one number, and spit out another number, okay? Well, if we have many of them, so you can think of these as like buttons on a calculator. So when you're doing something on a calculator, you can choose one of these operations. OK, so we're going to imagine we're going to think about sets. OK, and we're going to imagine that C is some set of these kind of operations. So maybe C is the set of you got the log operation, the squaring operation and the square rooting operation. OK. And if you're using a calculator, let's say you're going to pick a positive real number as your input. So maybe two or three or whatever. And you're going to pick one of these operations. So and then your output is going to be a real number. So the situation here is that you have basically some kind of uh, mapping, which is going to be taking in some operation and taking in your kind of numerical inputs and computing your numerical outputs. OK, so in this situation, in the category of sets, um, this arrow G here, we can think of it as a sort of parameterized mapping. OK, so you can basically um, do a mapping from A to B so in this case, this will be from a positive real to a real, but it's sort of parameterized by the value of C that you pick. For example, you might pick to do the squaring function, or you might pick to do the square rooting function or whatever. So you can pick an operation and a numerical input, and you get a numerical output. And this arrow G here that we can think of as a kind of mapping from A to B that's parameterized by C. This is really containing all that information about all the different mappings you can do um, by picking a different value of C, a different kind of calculator operation, if you like. So the important thing to realize then is that if you've picked a particular operation, let's say the squared operation, then you've really chosen a sort of mapping from A to B. OK, this is the important thing to realize because this is the essence of this kind of correspondence with the exponential objects. So let's think about how this works with some actual inputs. OK, so let's say you pick one of these unitary operations, little c. 
and you also pick one of these numerical inputs, G. So then when you sort of press your, when you press equals on your calculator, you'll get your result, okay? That'll be little g operating on C and A, okay? But what the exponential object uh, does for us is it gives us another way to think about this. And the basic idea is that once you've picked this little c, once you've picked one of these kind of uh, symbols, let's say the squared symbol, you've really defined a mapping from A to B, okay? If you say to yourself, I'm just going to pick the squared um, operation and then I'm going to choose different inputs and get different outputs, then you're studying the squaring function. You can, uh, you can think that this choice of this little c here is actually defining a function from a to b okay so how does this work well if we pick some little c some element of this set capital c then this is going to define a function now we call this function g bar of c and what is it well it has to take in a input, a value of A, and then it has to output something, okay? So the way it works is that this is gonna be a, a kind of mapping, and it takes in some A dash, some element of A, and then it maps it to G of little c a dash, okay? So this kind of um, notation, I'm not sure if I've used it before, it basically means maps to. Okay, so what this means, this symbol here, this maps to is it means that this G bar c is a function and it's going to take in this value a dash of a, whatever it is, and it's going to map it to g of c comma a dash, okay? And so this is how this g bar is going to be defined once we've fixed this g here. And so what we're doing here um, when we do this g bar times identity of a is we're taking this pair c comma a and we're going to operate this g bar on the c and we're going to operate the identity on the a so we're going to leave the a alone but we're going to convert this value of c in this case this operation into this sort of ready to evaluate function Okay, so the result over here is going to be g bar of c, comma a. And then finally, what does this evaluation arrow do? Well, all this evaluation arrow does is it takes this function and it operates it on this kind of input, okay? So you can think of, so you can think of this kind of thing, uh, which is the same as this. You can think of this as a kind of function which is waiting for an input A, okay? And once it's clipped with an input A and we do this evaluation arrow, this e a comma b upon this pair it just applies this function here to this input a and we get this output b okay so this is an alternative way to think about this operation in fact this way to think about it is probably more clear as far as how you actually do computations when you're using your calculator okay you think to yourself well I'm going to pick an operation, like say a squared operation, 
um, and that's going to define for me this sort of map from A to B and then I'm going to connect that with my input and then I'm going to evaluate okay but you know you could alternatively think about your calculator at least theoretically it's sort of capable of taking in any symbol any unitary function here and any input and giving us an output and you can think of it kind of being able to do all that type of stuff on the same level so this type of um, idea is also known as currying. Uh, it's very closely related to the lambda calculus that's very popular in computer science and programming. Um, I mean sometimes people might write this type of thing as something like lambda a dash comma G C comma A dash, which is just alternative notation for saying that this is basically something that's waiting for an input A dash and ready to apply this function G upon it uh, with this little C held fixed. So it's just basically alternative notation for this. But I'm not going to get too into lambda calculus because I, I don't want to introduce too many new things at once. So anyway. In the category of sets, this is how we can think about what exponential objects are, okay? Basically, um, we can think that an exponential object is like this uh, b to the power of a here. We can think of it as the set of functions from b to a, okay? And it's actually quite a profound thing that this is actually a set okay because basically in the category of sets our objects are sets okay and we know that we can do functions from one set to another set they're what define our arrows in this category of sets but the fact that there's a set of functions from a to b means that there's another object in our category which is kind of internalizing the idea of all of these relationships from object A to object B. So that whole collection of arrows from A to B, which could be something very vast, is itself kind of internalized in a particular object. And I mean, this is really quite a profound thing. And what we have here, like in general, is a general definition of exponential objects, which can be applied to many other kind of systems as well. And um, there's just so many applications to for exponential objects. I'll get into some more of them later, but let's just carry on trying to build some intuition about exponential objects in the category of sets. So the basic idea then is that if you have an arrow G, from C times A to B, um, you can always think of this as a sort of parameterized mapping. So we think that it's somehow, it's like a, a mapping from set A to set B, but it's kind of parameterized or dependent upon the element of C that we pick. And we think that whenever we have a situation like this, we can always take this alternative view via the exponential object. Um, we can, for this G, this arrow from C times A to B, we can find this unique arrow G bar that's going to translate this symbol C here, this element C, it's going to translate that and give us a mapping from A to B, which is basically defined like this. It's defined so that it's ready to take in any A dash and basically manipulate it in the same way as G would manipulate it when this C is held fixed. Um, and then we use this G bar with this C to give us this function from A to B, this kind of thing. And if we also keep this input, because we times it by the identity over here, so we keep this input, and then we have this pair of this function with this input, 
Then we can apply this evaluation arrow, E, which is going to give us the same result. Okay, so in general, in sets, we have these two ways around the triangle. One is just evaluating this on the input C and the input A. So the alternative way to do this is to take our input C comma A um, and then replace this C here with the kind of function that that C induces in a sense. We're replacing this little C here with this arrow. <clears throat> We're replacing this little C here with this function that just goes from A to B, this function here, which is basically acting on the elements of A, just like G does with this element C held fixed, okay? And so we replace this little C with this function here we keep our input the same and so over here now we have this function and this input and then we just do this evaluation which simply means we take this function and apply it to this a and we get the same results okay so that's how exponential objects work in sets so here's a nice kind of graphical example um i haven't seen this in any books but I think it's um, quite a good way of getting one's head around exponential objects, okay? So let's think about the case where these are all sets of real numbers, okay? So this G here, it's going to take in a real number little c and take in a real number little a and then it's going to spit out a real number um, which we can call a value in the set b, okay? Um, so we can really represent this situation, this kind of thing, by a surface, okay? So for any value of little c and little a, that will be a point in the plane. And then we have this surface, and the height that that surface has above our point in the plane is telling us the value of b, the outputs, the results of doing g upon little c and little a, okay? So we have this surface, and... So that's telling us about what this kind of arrow in our diagram means. What about going this way around? Well, I think the basic idea is that if we pick some value of little c here, we see according to the definition of the exponential object that there's going to be this unique arrow g bar. And what this arrow is doing is it's essentially allowing us to translate this value of little c, this kind of value here, translate it into a function from a to b, a function which basically is kind of like g, but with this c held fixed. Okay, so it really is um, a function from a to b. Okay, and we can think about this as simply slicing our surface with this kind of line which is going away from us in the picture. Okay, so if we pick a value of little c, um, then we essentially define this kind of function from a to b that we call g bar of c. And you see that this kind of function is ready to take in an input a dash, and it's going to output g of c comma a dash, okay? a dash being a value in this set capital A. And so if we do this, if we get this kind of g bar of c, and if we also pick our value of a, then we have this kind of pair, this function here, you can think of it geometrically like this kind of sliced thing. And also we have, let's say this uh, point a here, Well, if we have these two red things, um, that's this stuff. And then if we evaluate, then all we're doing is sort of evaluating this function at this point, finding the height um, of this function above this A value. And that's gonna give us the same result as if we just evaluate this capital G on C and A, okay? So this is a nice picture of what happens when these things are all real numbers, but the basic kind of underlying logic applies when 
these things are any sets at all, okay? And indeed, the same kind of ideas apply to many other kinds of categories. Um, so, I mean, this is a rough idea of what exponential objects mean in the category of sets. So in many cases in category theory, um, it's not so much a matter of using exponential objects, it's just knowing that they're there. In many cases, if you just know that they exist, you can infer some very profound things about the structure of your category. You can prove lots and lots of results. The simple existence of these kind of things, the, the simple idea that the kind of relationships uh, between two objects in your category are always internalized by some other object in your category is a very profound thing. And it has many implications, um, which often show that the kind of structure of your category hangs together very well, much like the category of sets does. Um, and also, I mean, these ideas um, are present in many other categories as well. So, for example, in the category of graphs, um, remember that the objects are graphs and the arrows are these kind of graph homomorphisms, these sorts of structure preserving um, maps from one graph to another. And in such a category, there is such a thing as an exponential graph, which is sort of like a graph that would represent all of the kind of homomorphisms from one graph to another graph. Um, in fact, exponential objects do more than that. They basically are able to emulate um, these ideas of parameterized mappings. Exponential objects can do a lot more than just this. In the category of categories, the exponential objects are actually these functor categories. So the entire category of graphs, for example, uh, which we've seen as a very interesting thing, is actually just an exponential object in the category of categories. And we're going to get onto that later. But I just wanted to carry on with a bit more intuition because there's some very interesting kind of intuition about exponential objects which connects with physics. Okay, so let's consider another example. Let's suppose now that this B here is space and this C here is a set of particles and this A here is time. Okay, so our situation is basically that, let's say this is space, okay? And we have this set of particles, I uh, see here. So here are some particles. And then we also have time and this G here is basically, let's say it's telling us how these particles are going to move over time. Okay, so at any given time for any given particle, let's say this particle gamma here, um, at any given time, it's gonna have some other location in space, okay? So there's going to be a sort of path sweeps out by that particle as it moves in time. And the same for all the other particles, okay? So what if we only had one particle here, then such a map would be basically um, telling us how one particle moves around in space at a given time. So you can think about it as kind of giving us a trajectory for that particle. But we're assuming, let's say, that we have many particles. So we can pick one particle little c, we can pick a time little a, and when we do g of c of a, that gives us the location in space where this particle is. Okay, so that's one way we can think about this kind of physical system. And of course, this is an extremely important physical system. Um, you know, there are so many examples in physics and so on, where we have many particles moving around in space. But using the idea of the exponential objects, we can get a kind of different view of this type of situation.
Because what this is telling us is that an alternative view of this is that we can take our particle, little c, and given this kind of function g here, which is telling us about how all, all our particles move, we can associate that little c with a trajectory, a function from time to space. Okay, so an alternative way to think about this situation is that every particle, little c, is associated with a trajectory, g bar of c, and that's going to be a function from time into space. Okay, and if we have this for a particular particle, and we have a particular time, and we evaluate where that particle is on its trajectory at a given time, that will give us the same result as if we just do this kind of parameterized mapping, which is basically telling us how all of our particles evolve together, this, this G here. And indeed, you can take these type of alternative views about how to think about things like this for any situation where you have a kind of function from the product of two sets to another set. Okay, so here's another example. Um, this is maybe a little bit fictitious, but I think it's interesting. I think it's oversimplified, but you could say that a person um, will have a certain goal if they're in a particular situation. Okay, so there's a kind of function which is going to associate a person, um, an element little c of this set, and a situation, an element little a, with a goal. Okay, um, so you know, you have different people in different situations, they want to do different things. Now, an alternative way to look at this is that for every person, little c, you can associate them with this kind of function, g bar of little c, which is a sort of mapping from a situation to a goal, okay? So every person has this kind of mapping which is telling them in what situation they're going to have what goal. Of course, this is oversimplified, but I think you see the point. And, um, I would urge you um, to try and make this list longer, okay? Think about more situations where you have this kind of um, case where you have some kind of mapping from C times A to B and think about the alternative view that you get on that situation when you involve this idea of exponentiation. Okay, so the point really about exponential objects, the, I would say the most useful kind of nuggets of information that we get from it is, is as follows, okay? The idea basically is, in general, in a general category, um, if we have exponential objects, then for a given object A and B, we're gonna have this object B to the power of A, and this thing, B to the power of A, paired with this evaluation arrow, uh, E, and sometimes I'll write it as E, A comma B sub subscripted, just to remind us that this is the evaluation arrow that's sending stuff from A to stuff in B, okay? So the exponential object is this paired with this arrow, and it has this property that for any arrow G like this, we can find this unique G bar that if we times it by the identity, it makes this diagram commute. So the important thing about this is really we have this kind of isomorphism, okay? So if we have an arrow G from C times A to B, we can always sort of imagine taking this A here and sort of lifting it up here, and we can sort of use the property of the exponential object to convert this kind of arrow to an arrow g bar from c to b to the power of a. Now g bar is sometimes called the transpose of g, it's sometimes called the exponential adjoint of g, um, and then of course we can also always go the other way around. So if we have this g bar and then we can always compute e after g bar times 1 to get g, okay? So 
we have this isomorphism, we can go from here to here using the exponential property, or we can go from here to here just by writing that g is equal to e after g bar times 1a. Now, um, sometimes um, we might use the notation in a bit of a different way. So sometimes we might say, well, we have a general arrow, say an arrow h from c to b to the power of a. And then that's going to correspond using this correspondence, that's going to correspond to an arrow from C times A to B. And the kind of long name for an arrow like that would be E after h times 1a, but we may also denote that as h u, okay? So we've kind of, we're kind of using symbols to denote how we're changing things under isomorphism, under this isomorphism, okay? When we change this arrow from the product to b, we change this g into a kind of g bar, or a kind of, you could call it a kind of G cap or G N, you know, this little line on top is curving down slightly. Um, and alternatively, when we go this way around, well, it's like here, we're changing this H into this kind of H with a little U on top. And that's basically just saying that we're taking this H and we're forming this composition with the evaluation arrow and we're getting this thing which is basically the thing that this is the transpose of. And some authors would also call this the transpose of this. And of course, if you, if you adopt that terminology and you transpose an arrow twice, you get back the same arrow again, okay? Um, also, as I say, I sometimes write E A comma B, and sometimes I'll just write this as E. Okay, so the usual way that people explain what the exponential object is in a category is they say that it's an object which is like an internal representation of the arrows from A to B. Now in the category of sets, the exponential object literally does correspond to the set of arrows, the set of functions from A to B. But of course, more generally, um, this is more complex, right? So for example, in the category of graphs, this is a graph and somehow the structure of that graph um, contains all the information about the mappings from A to B. But that's not all there is to an exponential object. I mean, the real thing about what an exponential object is, is simply this definition, this kind of universal property that the exponential object is this object, b to the power of a, and this arrow, e here, from b to the power of a times a to b, such that for any g from c times a to b, there's a unique g bar that makes this diagram commute. Okay, that's literally what an exponential object is. It's more than just a way of representing all of the arrows from A to B. But it does have that property, and it's quite useful to understand this, okay? So basically, um, the way we can understand um, why B to the power of A can be considered to encode the kind of collection of arrows from A to B is by thinking about what points of B to the power of A are like. What is the point of an object? Well, a point of an object is 
an arrow into that object from the terminal object. We usually denote the terminal object as a one. So if you recall in the category of sets, a terminal object is a set with a single element. And so a point of a set is an arrow into that set from the terminal object. And that's essentially selecting an element of the set. So um, in the category of sets, knowing about what the points are of an object, um, as in knowing about what the arrows into it are from the terminal object, pretty much tells you everything about that object. Because if you know how many elements you have in your set, that's pretty much all there is to know about an object in the category of sets. Um, but it's different in the category of graphs. So in the category of graphs, this is the terminal object, this graph that just has one vertex linked to itself. And there are graphs which don't have any points. You see this graph has two points, but there's more structure to it than just that. So just knowing about what the points are doesn't tell you everything about a graph, usually. Okay. Um, anyway, we can ask quite a profitable question, which is what is a point of this exponential object, e to the power of a? Um, and the way we can understand this is basically by thinking about this kind of isomorphism here, um, which is really, sometimes I'll call it the kind of exponential isomorphism. It's the fundamental way of interchanging arrows, which the presence of an exponential object gives us. If we have an arrow g from c times a to b, um, the kind of universal property of the exponential object tells us that we have this unique arrow g bar from c to b time, from c to b to the power of a, such that g bar times one followed by e equals g. Okay, um, and conversely, if we have g bar, then we can do e after g bar times one to recover g. Okay, so we can go both ways in this. Now what we can do is we can think about what this relationship means when c is a terminal object. Okay, because then this bottom line here is going to be a point of b to the power of a. So we have that, well I'm writing it here, okay, here's a point of b to the power of a and we know that this corresponds to an arrow from one times a to b. So what I'm saying here is that if we have a point, let's call it g bar of b to the power of a, we know that that's going to correspond to an arrow g from 1 times a to b. So that's the kind of thing we want to talk about because um, there's an extra step in this and that is that, I mean, what is 1 times a? I mean, think about it in sets. If you take a set and do the Cartesian product of it with a single element set, what do you get? Well, you get that same set back again. And so you get something that's isomorphic by multiplying by a terminal object. And that's true in general, okay? So in general, there's always going to be this isomorphism where we have products and things like that. There's always this isomorphism between an object A and A times 1. And this, these are the arrows involved in the isomorphism, okay? So if you do the second projection on 1 times A, uh, that gives you A. And if you do this arrow, exclamation mark A, which is the unique arrow from A to 1, that's denoted as exclamation mark A. If we do exclamation mark A paired with identity of A, um, that's the kind of inverse of this isomorphism. So these two arrows are inverses of each other. D 
Doing this after this gives the identity of this. Doing this after this gives the identity of this. So you can check this. And um, yeah, it's pretty important. I'm not going to go through the proof of it, but probably if you Google products with the terminal object isomorphism, you will probably find a proof of this quite readily. It's, it's pretty easy to find the proof yourself, actually. So here's the point here. We have this arrow G from one times A to B. And then if we just sort of attach this isomorphism beforehand, um, we see that this kind of arrow is equivalent to an arrow like this, which is this arrow G after exclamation mark A comma one A, and that is an arrow from A to B. And, you know, these are sort of two isomorphisms, so we can go back again the other way around as well. So we do see that points of B to the power of A correspond with arrows from A to B in a general category, okay, not just in the category of sets. So this is a really important relationship for understanding the kind of basic things you can do with exponential objects. So we want to give some names to stuff. So let's write, let's define F such that FP2 is equal to G, okay? Just um, because it's easy to talk about it this way. So if we think about what's written in green here, um, if we have F P2 equals G, if we, sorry, if we have F P2 equals G, well, here we have a G bar. And so G bar becomes F after P2 bar, which is here, okay? So this is F after P2 all transposed. And we have a special name for this. We call this, the name of F. So it's sometimes written as F in quotes, okay? But it's really just shorthand for F after P2 all transposed, okay? And what does this look like? Well, it basically looks like this. We have one times A, and then we do P2, and we get A. P2 is this isomorphism here. And then we do F. And we get B. And so then if we take the transpose of this, we get this point of B to the power of A, which we call the name of F. Okay. Now we know by the property of the exponential object, or if you follow this reasoning, we know this corresponds to F after P2, um, kind of, this is the transposed arrow and this is the ordinary arrow. And we know by this kind of isomorphism that this corresponds to this arrow F from A to B, which is actually the same as this, okay? Uh, provided we say that G equals F after P2. So that's fine. There is this one-to-one -one correspondence between points of an exponential object and arrows from A to B. But so what? Um, what does that mean? If we have a point of an exponential object, what does it mean? What, we, what can we compute with it? Okay. Um, well, it does mean something. And we can understand this by this kind of picture here. Let's just rub out this now, we don't need it anymore. Okay, so let's start by looking at the bottom line of this. So what have we got going on here? Well, we have a point of b to the power of a times a. And it's this pair of arrows. So what it really is, is it's a point delta bar of b to the power of a. So if we were in the category of sets, this would be a function from ascending a to b. 
but we're talking in generality now, okay? Um, so we have a point delta bar, of b to the power of a, and we have a point alpha of a. And those are paired together, okay? And what we're doing then is we're evaluating those. So if you're thinking in the category of sets, this will be like, well, you have a function from a to b, and you have an element of a, and you're going to do that fun when you evaluate, you do that function on that element. But we're thinking uh, in more generality, okay? And we're actually going to see that basically, yes, this does work like that. Works kind of like that in general, okay? Um, so, so what do we do next once we have this? Well, basically we add in some extra arrows we add in these blue arrows and this red arrow and the claim is that this diagram commutes okay so if you take any couple of paths in this diagram and compose the arrows that go to the same place you'll get the same results okay so essentially what i'm saying is that this triangle commutes and this square commutes why does this triangle commute? Well, because this is basically the, this basically commutes by the definition of the exponential objects. We have this arrow delta from one times a to b, and this is its transpose, and e after its transpose times one should give this. This is just the definition of an exponential object. So this triangle commutes, why does this square commute? Well, the argument's basically here, okay? If we compose along these blue arrows, um, we're doing delta bar times one after exclamation mark a comma one a after alpha. We can take this alpha inside here. Um, and when we do exclamation mark a after alpha that's just going to be the identity of one because if you imagine um, doing exclamation mark a that's this arrow um, to the terminal object and composing these two gives the arrow from the terminal object to the terminal object which is just the identity of one Also, when we take this inside the bracket this way, we just get 1a after alpha, which is just alpha. So composing this bit gives us this bit, okay? Um, and also, delta bar times 1a is really, the way I think of it at least, it's just shorthand for delta bar p1 comma 1a p2, okay? And then we do the next step. Again, we just sort of take this inside the brackets using that previous result I discussed. And so we really ought to just rewrite this where we rub out this thing on the right and put a copy of it here and a copy of it here. But then we're doing P1 of it. So that'll just select the one, which is just an identity that doesn't do anything. And then when we do P2 on this, we'll just select the alpha. So we'll have 1A after alpha, which is just an alpha. So we see that indeed these blue arrows do compose to give us delta bar comma alpha. So, okay, what does all this mean then? Well, the bottom line is that we have this equation holding, that doing this evaluation on this delta bar and this alpha gives us the same result as doing delta after exclamation mark a comma 1a after alpha. So that's this way around. And what's the significance of this? Well, the point of it really is that what's this? And what this is, is this is the arrow that delta bar is the name of okay so we could call this the k 
such that the name of K is equal to delta bar. And that's how we can understand how exponentiation, how this, and that's how we can understand how this evaluation arrow works on general points of b to the power of a. Because all we basically do is we look at the kind of points that's fed into here, the point of b to the power of a, and we say, what is the arrow from a to b that this is the name of? And then we just apply that arrow to the point of A that we're working with, alpha in this case. Um, so we see this quantity, it's over here, look. And um, under this kind of isomorphism, this corresponds to this arrow delta from 1 times A to B. And under this kind of exponential isomorphism, this corresponds to our point um, delta bar of b to the power of a. And really, this is the name of this arrow here from a to b. So this situation is kind of like this situation in reverse, if you like. What I really want to do now is to introduce a special kind of arrow. So when we have an arrow f, from B to C, it's possible to define an arrow, which we could call F to the power of A. And this is gonna be an arrow from B to the power of A to C to the power of A. And it has a very special property, which is that if we have a point of b to the power of a, let's say the name of h, then we have that doing f to the power of a after the name of h gives us the name of f after h. So essentially what this arrow f to the power of a well, I should probably draw it down here. What this arrow f to the power of a does for us is it allows us to internalize the idea of composition. In fact, it's, it's even more interesting than just this. This is only kind of part of what this arrow can do, um, but it's very useful for us. Um, so what I want to do now is to define this arrow. So a way we can think about what this kind of f to the power of a thing allows us to do. I mean, um, suppose in set, for example, we have um, some arrow f from b to c. And what we want to do, we want to compose that f with some other arrow h, say, from a to b. OK, so we want to consider F after H. But let's say for some reason, and there can be quite a few reasons for this, um, which will become apparent more, for example, when we're talking about topos theory in future videos. But suppose that we want to think about this composition as internalized, OK, because we know that the kind of points of B to the power of A, that these points here, correspond to arrows from A to B. And so if we pick out one of these points, let's say in set, okay, so we pick out one of these, one of these functions from A to B. Well, the thing is that I'm gonna tell you how we can define this arrow f to the power of a which is going to be an arrow from b to the power of a to c to the power of a
And the idea is that f to the power of a after the name of h is going to be the name of fh. So we're able to get the representation of this arrow from a to c in here, given the representation of h and given this arrow f. But we're all sort of able to do this all internally. Okay, so it's a very interesting kind of idea. So anyway, what we really want to do is give a definition for f to the power of a. And I am going to do that, but the way I want to approach this is by the direction of adjoint functors. Now, um, I did a video on adjoint functors, but I realized that it's a fairly abstract kind of subject. So if you're into adjoint functors, then, you know, this next 20 minutes or so should um, mean quite a lot to you. If you haven't absorbed the ideas about adjoint functors, don't worry, because it's just a way really of explaining why this f to the power of a is defined the way it is. So here we go. Um, we're going to work in what's called a Cartesian closed category. Okay, so that's a category that has certain special properties. In particular, it has a terminal object. It has a product for every pair of objects. And it has an exponential object for every pair of objects, okay? Categories like that have many special features that make them kind of like set. I mean, set is a Cartesian closed category with lots of extra nice features. But um, if you have the Cartesian closed properties, then you already have lots of nice kind of algebra that you can do. Um, but anyway, so here's the thing I want to get across. Um, you may recall um, quite a few videos ago, probably in um, my video on functors and duality, um, I talked about how there's a functor or there can be a functor from a category to itself, which just involves multiplying everything by a particular object. Okay, so if you, um, have a category and then you can define this functor if you have all products defined um, or finite products you can get your category and you can send every object to that object multiplied by a okay the product of that object with a and you can send every arrow f to f times the identity of a OK, so this is a kind of functor. Now, this is going to be a functor from our category. Let's call our category K. OK, um, this is going to be a functor from K to K. Um, and if we have all these products and exponential objects and things, um, this is going to be what we're going to have is we're going to have that there is a right adjoint to this functor. And this right adjoint is another functor, and we could call it the exponential functor. OK, so it's going to send an object B to B to the power of A. It's going to basically allow us to do all this exponentiation and it's also going to give us a notion of what happens when we raise an arrow f from b to c to the power of a okay so pretty much to get at this functor all we need to do is realize that it's the right adjoint to this product functor and then we just need to remember how do we construct the right adjoint to a functor so here goes then, okay, suppose that this exponentiation to the power of a functor is the right adjoint to this producting with a functor here. Now, 
we're not really going to assume we know anything about the structure of this yet. We're going to infer it just by saying that it's the right adjoint. So if you recall how adjoint functors work, we can do this, okay? So what is the effect then of doing this functor on this object B? Well, what we want is a terminal morphism. Okay, so usually when you're dealing with adjoint functors, these functors are going between two distinct categories. So maybe this one would be category K, and this one would be category L or something. But in this case, these are both the same categories, okay? Because these are sort of endofunctors, functors going from the category to itself. Um, but I'm still going to talk about them as the left category and the right category because it's, it's easier, okay? So when we want to work out what the effect is of doing this functor on this object B here in the left category, what we want to ask ourselves is, what is a terminal morphism from this functor here, this one, the functor we're taking the right adjoint of, from this functor to B? Okay, so what is a terminal morphism from blank times A to B? So what is that? Um, well, we remember that a terminal morphism consists of an object in this right category together with an arrow from where that object lands when we do this left functor on it we do blank times a on it in this case um, so it, we have this object and this arrow from where it lands under the left functor to b and that has to have the property that for any other object in the right category an arrow from where that lands under applying the left functor to B, we can emulate the effect of this kind of phony, this um, candidate, this, this wannabe, by having this unique arrow over here. And this, and this is sometimes called the adjunct to this G here. And this has the property that if we do this left functor on this arrow, then we get this arrow here, which allows us to emulate the effect of this kind of candidate, this phony here, um, by doing our actual arrow in the terminal morphism after this arrow here, which is the left functor operating on this kind of um, arrow here, this unique one that makes this triangle commute. Okay, so that's the idea of a terminal morphism. If you watch my video on universal properties, um, you'll see this idea more carefully explained. Um, but the idea then is that the thing we get by the object over here in this right category that we get by doing the right adjoint of our functor on this object B, in other words, the result of doing B to the power of A, is this object which is involved in this terminal morphism from blank times A to B. So it is this object which has this arrow from where it lands under, under blank times A uh, with this sort of universal property that, you know, if we try and... Um, emulate this effect with something else, then we can find this unique way to um, sort of emulate the effect of what that candidate is doing, okay? Um, so then what this is basically telling us is we're going from the theory of adjoint functors and we are automatically getting the definition of an exponential object. I mean, the definition of an exponential object is just exactly um, falling out of this idea of the right adjoint to this functor here. Um, but there's more to it because I say that this is a functor, okay? So it doesn't just operate on objects, it operates on arrows. So then we need to recall how the right adjoint to a functor works on arrows. 
okay? So here we have an arrow in our kind of left category here, this arrow F from B to C. Like I say, these are there's gonna be a left category over here. Let's say there's a right category over here. So we'll have um, B to the power of A and C to the power of A. So say we've got a sort of right category somewhere down here. I mean, this is actually all going on in the same category, this category K. It's just that I don't want to, uh, I, I like to be able to sort of point at stuff on the left and point at stuff on the right and think about the functors like going between them, just like I've drawn in this picture here. Okay. Um, so what's the idea then? Well, we have this, we have two exponential objects now. We have b to the power of a, together with its evaluation arrow eab, so that's forming one terminal morphism um, from blank times a to b, and then we have c to the power of a and eac forming a terminal morphism from blank times a to b, sorry, from blank times a to c, okay? So what do we do next? Well, what we do next is we compose these two arrows. So we get this arrow here. So we can call this arrow F after E, A, B. But now look what we have, okay? We have a true terminal morphism from blank times A to C. What is that? That's this object C to the power of A and this Evaluation arrow, EAC, which goes from where C to the power of A got sent to by multiplying by A to C. But we also now have a pretender. We have this blue arrow here, F, E, A, B. And this is an arrow from where this object lands when we do this multiply by A functor. And it goes into C. So this being a kind of pretender, there's going to be a unique adjunct to this arrow, and that's going to be an arrow like this. And that has the property that when we do L upon it, we get something that's going to make this triangle commute, okay? And just like we call this one a transpose, this is also called a transpose. So this adjunct, this is F, E, A, B, transpose. And we're going to also call this F to the power of A. And this is just what we want. In fact, if you look at the way that adjoint functors are defined in general, this is exactly how you figure out what the right adjoint to your functor does on an arrow in your left category. You just sort of form these terminal morphisms, um, compose two arrows together, so you have a kind of candidate going into one of the things that you already have a terminal morphism into, and then you can form a kind of adjunct to that candidate, something to kind of complete the triangle and make the diagram commute when you apply the left functor on it. So this then we can call f to the power of a times 1a. And that's the unique arrow which makes this triangle commute. And of course it is. And of course it is, because this arrow here is the transpose of F after EAB. And so if we do evaluation after this thing times 1, what's that going to give us? Well, it's going to give us F after EAB, which is this blue arrow here. Okay, so this all makes sense. The bottom line, the only real thing we need to know is that the definition of F to the power of A is f e a comma b 
transposed. Okay then, so what we'd like to do, now we have this expression f after e all transposed for this arrow f to the power of a that we wanted. What we want to do is to now prove that it can do this kind of internalization of composition that we're interested in. So I'm about to prove that, but just before I do, let me just um, say something, which is that we now have a functor, which is like a kind of exponentiation functor. So just as we had this idea of a functor, which takes the objects in our category and multiplies them by a, it takes the arrows in our category and multiplies them by the identity of a, Similarly, we now have another functor from our category to itself. This one sends every object to that object raised to the power of a, and it sends every arrow to that arrow raised to the power of a. And this is a proper functor. We kind of know that because we achieved it by finding it as a right adjoint, but it's also possible to prove that it's a functor directly. Um, might be a good exercise to check understanding. But anyway, it is a functor, so I just wanted to mention that. Now, let's get to the matter in hand, which is to show that this kind of triangle commutes, to show that doing f to the power of a on the name of h gives us the name of f of h, by which I mean f after h, okay? Um, the name of f after h. So, how are we going to show this? Well, actually, we're going to go one better. We're going to show something more general. So more generally, if we have an arrow G from C times A to B, then we actually have this relationship holding. OK, so this is more general. This says that F to the power of A after the transpose of G gives us the transpose of f after g. So we're actually going to prove this because it's just about as easy and then we're going to get this as a special case. So how do we prove this result? Well, basically we just write down a commuting diagram and do some pretty simple reasoning. Okay, so the first claim then is that this diagram commutes. So where did this diagram come from? Well, this square on the right here is just this square down here. And we remember that f to the power of a was really designed to make this square commute, okay, when it's defined according to this, when f to the power of a is the transpose of f after e, okay? So that square commutes, and why does this triangle commute? Well, that's just the definition of the transpose of g. OK, it's always such that it makes this triangle commute. So this whole diagram commutes. So what? Well, let's do some equations now then. So what about if we start with F after H? What about if we start with F after G? There it is. Well, because this diagram commutes, we know that that's the same as EAC after FA times 1 after G transpose times 1. Now, if we compose these two arrows, it's a general thing when, when you have arrows like this, you can sort of compose them component wise. OK, so this composition of this after this, again, you can check this using the properties of um, products that I was talking about before. You can check that this composed with this is F to the power of A after G transpose all times by one A. So this whole path going along the top and the right is EAC after F to the power of A, G transpose times 1A. Well, OK, that's fine. But we also know that this is F after G. And there's another way that we can write F after G. We can use the properties of the exponential. So we know because of the general properties of exponentials that we can write this as the evaluator after the transpose of this times one. 
So we have that these things are equal. But also, and this is an important trick when you're dealing with exponentials, remember that there's actually just a unique arrow that if we do the evaluator after it times the identity, we get f after g. So there's only one kind of arrow like this that makes this kind of equation hold. But we see that the forms of these two equations are the same. And since there's only one form that can make this fit, this expression here has to be equal to this expression here. So we have to have that f to the power of a after g transpose is f after g transpose. And that's the formula that we wanted. Well, OK, so we have that formula. Now, what we were really after was this was a proof that this works, wasn't it? So how do we get this? Well, all we do now is we remember that the name of H is just shorthand, really, for H after P2 all transposed. So we're going to make the substitution from here. We're going to substitute by saying, let's let G equal H after P2. And so now this on the left, this is F to the power of A after the transpose of H after P2. In other words, this is F to the power of A after the name of H. So under this substitution, this equals this and also equals this. So we get that F to the power of A after the name of H is by definition F to the power of A after H P2 transposed. And then using this identity that we've just proven under this substitution, we have that this is equal to F after H after P2 all transposed. Okay, because treating this as G and using this identity, we can transform this into this. And then we simply note that this is just the name of FH. So that proves that this triangle here commutes. OK, then, so it turns out that there's also another way that we can make a functor using exponentiation. So that previous example was a covariant functor, a normal one. But we can also make a contravariant functor. So the idea with this contravariant functor is we're actually sending things to b to the power of that thing. So we send an object a dash to b to the power of a dash. And we send this arrow g from a to a dash to this arrow b to the power of g, which goes from b to the power of a dash to b to the power of a. So this has its kind of source and target flipped because this is a contravariant functor. So this operation, kind of raising b to the power of an arrow, um, also allows us to internalize some aspects of composition, much like the last example did. So in particular, we get that b to the power of g of the name of k is the name of k after g. OK, so it's a little different this time, but we still have similar kinds of operations that we can do with this. It allows us to internalize the idea of composing things. I mean, in some very fuzzy sense, we can, a very, very fuzzy sense, we can think of something like, um, if we're trying to think about what something like b to the power of a dash might be like in the real world, it might be like, well, we have two um, kind of subjects or ideas, like say chemicals and plants, and then we'd have some kind of an expert or a catalogue or something in the world of the relationships between, say, chemicals and plants. And that might be something like an agronomist or something. So like someone who's an expert in certain kinds of relationships between one thing and another thing is akin to, in a very fuzzy sense, a sort of exponential object, a sort of internalization of the relationships between two things in the world within the world. 
and then these kind of arrows are kind of like communication between experts in some sense okay this is all extremely fuzzy to the point of being nonsensical but it might help to um, remember things at least anyway um, how does this b to the power of g actually work then well i'll just tell you the definition and the main property it has so the definition of it is it's the evaluation arrow of a dash comma b after this identity arrow times g okay and the main property that it has is this one here so if we have an arrow r from t times a to b then the transpose of r is going to go from t to b to the power of a and this kind of b to the power of g arrow has the property that if we do it after the transpose of r we get the transpose of r after 1t times g okay so this is our main formula i'll leave it up to you if you want to prove it um, but the application of it to this case where we're sort of dealing with these names of arrows is like this okay so we consider b to the power of g after the name of k that's properly written as b to the power of g after kp2 transposed um, and then just using this identity here we can rewrite this as kp2 1t times g all transposed and then this is just shorthand for p1 dash comma gp2 dash where these p1 dash and p2 dash are just projections and then when we do kp2 on that and transpose it we get k g p2 trans we get k g p2 dash all transposed and that's just the name of k after g okay so as an example of it an example application of this um consider in the category of graphs we have this um single vertex graph I'll call that V underlined. We also have this single edge graph here. I'll call that E underlined. And we have this arrow S. Well, actually, I'll call it S underlined. It's um, the arrow that sends V to be the source of this edge. And then let's say we have some other graph over here. Let's say a graph X. Now, this exponential object in the category of graphs, uh, X to the power of E underlined, the points of that graph are going to correspond to edges because they're going to correspond to arrows from E underlined to X. And we have this kind of contravariant functor, as I've just kind of discussed, which would be x to the power of s underlined that goes to x to the power of v underlined. So notice this goes in the opposite direction. s underlined goes from v to e x to the power of s on the line goes from x to the power of e to x to the power of v and now if we have a point of x to the power of e let's say a point epsilon that's essentially going to correspond to an edge of x it's going to correspond to an arrow from here to x um, and then if we do 
so actually let's call this let's say it's the name of epsilon okay so we're thinking of epsilon is actually an arrow um from e to x and this is the name of it okay so this is the point of x to the power of e that this corresponds to so then doing x to the power of s after the name of epsilon is going to give us the name of so this, uh, this arrow down here, um, this composition, this is going to be the name of epsilon after S underlined, okay? And that is actually going to be like epsilon after S underlined is going to be the source vertex of whatever edge epsilon's pointing out in x okay so this is then an internal way to describe that we're saying we have a point in x to the power of e representing this edge of our graph and then doing this operation x to the power of s is then sending that to the point of x to the power of v that corresponds to the vertex of that graph okay so we want to do category theory okay we want to understand what's going on with some category so we want to be able to talk about the objects and the arrows and how to compose the arrows but it turns out that we can do this uh, from a kind of external standpoint okay so just like in the category of sets we're able to get this kind of singleton set and we could talk about elements in another set as kind of functions or arrows from this singleton set this terminal object in the category of sets well we can do a similar thing in the category of categories okay so in the category of categories the objects are categories and the the kind of arrows between them are functors so it turns out that if we just select a few of these we can really talk about most of the goings on inside a category um, in terms of sort of arrows into that category so so for example suppose we want to refer to an object a in a category well we can do so from a kind of external perspective um, by thinking of this object A as a kind of arrow which goes from this category here to object A. All right, so let me try and explain a bit about what's going on here. Firstly, what's this? Well, this is just a category with one object and the only arrow is the identity arrow. So this is actually the terminal object in the category of categories. It's just the kind of simplest non-empty category. It just has one thing. I mean, this is in a sense, the sort of um, main way we can talk about a thing in category theory. So this is our sort of basic category, which just has one object and as fewer arrows as possible. Okay, um, now what are these dotted arrows? Well, these are just identity arrows, okay? So I've been calling them like the identity arrow of this. I've been calling it IDA in previous videos. I, I want to switch to a notation. Um, I want to call it one subscript A instead, okay? So I'm now using these ones to denote these identity arrows. And okay, what's this red arrow then? Well, this is actually a functor, okay? So it's a functor from this kind of simple category uh, into this category C that we're interested in. And what it's doing is it's sending this object star to A and it's sending the identity arrow star to the identity arrow of A. So hopefully you can see that that's really sort of picking out this object in our category and really we can actually think of the objects in our category as arrows from this kind of terminal objects in the category of categories okay so 
I mean, we could really call this funk tour here A, because that's really what it's doing. Another thing to notice, just a sort of convention I'm using today, I'm drawing these funk tours as they work on arrows, because in this case, if we know how these funk tours are, are working on arrows, then we know how they work on objects. That's kind of forced, okay? Um, for example, if this funk tour sends this identity arrow here to this one here, we know it has to send the object star to the object A, all right? Um, okay, so we can refer to the objects in a category like so. How can we refer to the arrows? Well, we have this category here. So the way we describe arrows in our category is using this sort of template, this category, which we call two. Okay, so this category has these two objects, zero and one. We, of course, we have to have their identity arrows. And in addition to that, we just have one extra arrow. Uh, which is an arrow from object zero to object one. Now I'm calling that arrow zero less than or equal to one, okay? Because I'm using this kind of notation of pre-orders. Um, and if you're not familiar with pre-orders, I don't worry too much. Suffice to say that a pre-order is a category where there's at most one arrow between any pair of objects. And... Um, this notation, we can simply think of it as a name for the arrow in this category two that goes from zero to one, okay? So there's nothing really complicated going on here. Now, what about if we want to refer to this arrow F? Well, we can do so um, using a functor from two. So in particular, this functor here. that will refer to F. Okay, this is good. Now, what about if we want to talk about the source of this arrow F? So here we have this arrow F, we're now sort of got an externalized kind of picture of it as a functor from this category two into the category C, but what if we want to be able to say that a here is the source of this arrow, okay? We might want to say things like that. So how can we say that? Well, what we can do is let's introduce a special arrow that goes from one to two, a special kind of functor. And this functor works like this. So let's call this functor source okay now we have a rather interesting kind of relationship now which is that if we compose this functor and this functor we actually get this functor a here which refers to the object okay so this is our kind of external way of being able to say what the kind of source and target of an arrow are. And it, it's actually very similar to what we were doing in the category of graphs. So we can now sort of say that A is the source of this arrow F from a kind of external perspective. And the way we can say this is we can say A is equal to F after source. So notice here that I am talking, when I'm talking about A, F and source here, I'm, I'm talking about these, these functors, these red and blue arrows. They're arrows between objects in this category of categories. OK, um, but with this equation, I'm really saying that 
if we sort of pick out the source of this arrow and then move it as this arrow moves to be an arrow from to be this arrow f from a to b um, then we're really sort of highlighting this object which is where the arrow starts from okay and of course one can do a similar thing um, using an arrow like this to this that we could call target and then we can also talk about the target of an arrow okay um, so that's great. Now we can refer to the objects and the arrows and the source and the targets of the arrows. Okay, we, we're getting close to be able to do all category theory and it's really great to be able to do this kind of stuff because you can take a sort of description of something going on um, in a category and you can sort of convert it all into this language um, where we really see there are these kind of fundamental categories floating around outside that are really sort of referring to all the important things that are going on. And we can sort of view the goings on inside a category as kind of just like interactions between these kind of elementary particles in the, in the universe of categories, if you like. Um, and... It's all very interesting, but there's another thing that we want to be able to do, a very important thing in category theory, which is composing arrows, okay? So, I mean, composing arrows is, is sort of the lifeblood of category theory. So how can we talk about when arrows can be composed and how can we actually sort of talk about the composition process uh, from this sort of external viewpoint? Okay, so we want to be able to compose arrows within our category C. So when we have two arrows um, and we want to compose them, the first thing we need to know is, are they composable? Okay, so for example, this arrow F and this arrow G are composable because the target of F is the source of G. And we could, you know, we could um, actually talk about that um, using the kind of thing I was just saying about how we can refer to the source and target of arrows in this external viewpoint. Anyway, um, so we need to have um, a kind of source and a target arrow, and then there ought to be a composition. So this kind of process of composition really involves kind of three arrows, something like F that we could call before, something like G that we could call after, and something like G after F that we could call the result of composition. So we can really represent this whole kind of, um, this whole kind of family of stuff related to a particular arrow composition as a functor from this category three into our category C. So, this category three here just is kind of like, so this category three here uh, just has these three objects, zero, one, and two, and it has an arrow from zero to one, and an arrow from one to two, and an arrow from zero to two, and identities, and that's it, okay? So this is really um, a very kind of simple pre-order that represents composition in some sense. So we can refer to this kind of family of arrows re related to this composition as a functor from three into this category C. What kind of functor? Well, a functor like this. And I think a good name for this sort of functor might be something like F, G, G after F. Because so it's really picking out these three arrows which are involved in this composition, okay? Um, 
And so if you think about it, whenever you have um, sort of two composable arrows and the result that you get from composing them, you can represent it as a functor from three into that structure and vice versa. Functors from here into your category will correspond to the kind of triple of arrows involved in a composition. OK, um, and that's great because we can now sort of um, we can now refer to the actual goings on within the composition in this kind of external way. OK, so how could we, for example, refer to the before arrow F? Well, we can have a functor like this. Which we might call before. And then we can really say that this arrow F is the kind of before arrow involved in this kind of composition triple uh, by writing that F equals F. G, G after F, after before. Okay, so um, in a similar way, and pretty much the same way, we can say that there's another arrow from here which picks out the after. And we can write that G is equal to FG, G after F, all after, after. And we can also then refer to the results of this composition uh, in a similar way. We just need one more of these kind of external comparison arrows this one which we could say is called results and then we'll get another equation like this So this is a way then that we can refer to sort of arrow composition from this external kind of perspective. And it's extremely useful. Um, I should just say a bit of notation here. Here I'm thinking about actually composing arrows internally within the category. So maybe I might want to put a little um, subscript C there to represent that that's composition inside the category. Whereas this composition here is composition of functors, arrows between categories, in the category of categories. And the sort of core message is that this composable pair of arrows, F and G, together with their results, corresponds to this arrow, which we call F, G, G after F. And this is an arrow coming out of this category three, which kind of picks out our triple of a before arrow and after arrow and a result arrow. And then by doing these kind of compositions with these external functors, we're able to actually refer to which is which by just sort of composing some other functor before this red functor here that picks out our triple. Okay. 
So this is very, very powerful because it really has allowed us to externalize uh, the goings on of category theory. And I mean, I think it's, um, it's very remarkable um, how easy this is and how much easier it makes category theory because um, we're really sort of um, getting to the fundamental kind of language. I mean, one of the reasons we like category theory is because we can describe everything in terms of objects and arrows, primarily arrows, okay? And here we now have a kind of arrow based way to actually do category theory. So we're able to, we don't have to always be talking about, well, um, you know, what's the set of objects, what's the set of arrows, what's the kind of, um, you have a functor and it does this and that. We don't really have to worry so much about the bits anymore because we've sort of, we're able to sort of externalize all our description. So all we really need to know is that there are functors and functors are some kinds of arrows and there are these kind of fundamental objects and we can do loads of things in category theory with them. Okay, so I want to try and demonstrate that this kind of way of talking about category theory sort of externally. So thinking on the level of the category of categories and thinking of objects in a particular category as arrows from the terminal object into that category and so on. I want to um, try and show you that that way is a really great way to think of category theory because we can take concepts, for example, what is the product of two categories? And we can really see exactly where the kind of definitions come from when working from that kind of perspective. Now, I've talked about the product of categories before. Um, in some of the earlier videos, I talked about this. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to obtain that definition straight from the definition of the categorical product of a pair of objects. So there's a sort of general definition in any category for how we can make the categorical product of a pair of objects. Now, it's not always actually possible to obtain a product of a pair of objects in a general category, but in this category of categories, uh, which I shall henceforth call cat, it is possible to obtain a product of any pair of objects. Um, in fact, um, you can obtain a product of any collection of objects. So I'll just say a couple of kind of cryptic remarks, which I won't elaborate on because I don't really have, I don't really build them on these ideas in this video, but just to say quickly, uh, the terminal object can be considered to be the product of no objects and a object with its identity arrow can be considered to be the product of one object and we can build the product of three or more objects by kind of repeatedly doing the product of pairs of objects okay but you don't need to worry about any of that i'm just going to talk about how we can do the product of pairs of objects the kind of usual one so how can we do this well first we need to remember what the definition of the categorical product of a pair of objects is um, now we're really thinking about what's happening in this category of categories so our objects are going to represent categories and our arrows are going to represent functors but we're not going to concern ourselves with that at the moment we're really just going to just for the next uh, few minutes we're just going to think about what's happening in a general category so we have some category we have an object a and an object b now the now a categorical product of those is going to be an object which we can call a times b which has an arrow p1 into a and an arrow p2 into b which satisfies certain special properties what special properties does it have well 
the only property it has to have is that for any object H, which has an arrow F into A and an arrow G into B, there exists a unique arrow from H to A times B, which I'm calling F comma G, which makes this diagram commute. Okay, so there may be many arrows from H to A times B, but there's only one which makes this diagram commute for this F and G. Okay, and this is so for any kind of product candidate H. All right, so that's the definition of the categorical product in general. Now, also in general, what this implies is that there's this very interesting relationship. So uh, what this notation means, um, when we have this horizontal line here, we're really denoting a kind of isomorphism. Okay, so there's a kind of um, way to interchange these two things. So if we have an object H with an arrow F into A and an arrow G into B, then by the definition of the categorical products, we obtain this unique arrow F comma G from H to A times B, um, which has the property that if we do P1 after F comma G, we get F. And if we do P2 after F comma G, we get G like so. OK. Now, um, that's sort of going from here to here using this kind of universal property that categorical products have. We can also, of course, go the other way. If we have this arrow F comma G uh, from H to A times B, then we can just do P1 after it to get F, and we can do P2 after it to get G. So we really have this isomorphism. Given a pair of arrows out of H um, into A and B, we can get this arrow, which is sort of like paired those things together and sending it into A times B. And similarly, given this, we can kind of get the components F and G from this arrow, F comma G. All right then, so that's all in general. Okay then, so that's all in general. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use our ideas of being able to externalize discussions of objects and arrows to work out what the structure of this A times B thing is, okay? And this is actually uh, surprisingly easy uh, in a sense. So what we do, firstly, let's consider the case where H is equal to one. Remember that's this category that looks like this, okay? So let's now think about this situation in this case. So, okay, if this is one, if this is this single object, single arrow category, then what's a functor? So what's a functor F from this H to A? Well, that's an object of A. And what's this G? Well, that's an object of B, it corresponds to an object of B. Um, and what is this F comma G? Well, that's going to be an object of A times B. And so what we get is that there's a one to one correspondence between the kind of pairs of an object of A and an object of B with an object of A times B. And so now we at least know kind of what the set of objects is of A times B. We can really think of it as the set of pairs of an object of A and an object of B. So, okay, we can sort of formalize this intuition like this. Okay, so we can say that an object 
A in category A and an object B in category B, that pair, that corresponds to a pair of functors, which we might call A and B, which come out of this terminal object. This one goes into A and this B goes into category B. And using our kind of um, notion of a categorical product, we see that this is equivalent to an arrow called A comma B, which goes from one to the product of categories A and B. And then this just corresponds to an object which we might call A comma B, which is in the product of these categories A and B. So the kind of long shot of this is that the collection of objects in this product here is what can be thought of as the Cartesian product of the collection of objects in A and the collection of objects in B. And we also can understand how these kind of projection arrows work here, because, for example, we have P1 after A comma B is A. OK, so these projection arrows are just either, you know, we can take a pair of objects, apply a projection, and we can either get the first object if we do P1 or the second object if we get P2. Um, I'm kind of omitting these little circles that mean after quite a lot today because I'm sure we're all getting quite familiar with arrow composition. So, Okay then, so we know that the objects of this product are just pairs of objects and object from A and an object from B. Turns out that there's something very similar going on with the arrows. And we can see that by replacing this object T here with our category two, our category with just one non-trivial arrow between two distinct objects, okay? Um, and basically we have a very kind of similar argument. We have that an arrow F in A and an arrow G in B well, that can be represented as a sort of functor coming out of 2 into A, called little f, and a functor coming out of 2 to B, called little g. Then using the definition of the categorical product, we see that this corresponds to this unique arrow um, from 2 to A times B that we could call f comma g. And this is just picking out an arrow of A times B this functor is sort of picking out this arrow of the product. And that, of course, corresponds to an arrow f comma g in a times b. So we know now um, at least the sort of order of the... So we know now at least what the collection of arrows of a times b looks like. And once again, we have that if we do p1... Uh, after one of these arrow descriptions, we get the kind of first arrow in the pair uh, in A. And similarly, doing the second projection gives us the second arrow, G, in B. So we know what the objects are, what the arrows are, and how the projections work. But we don't quite know yet how the arrows are related to the objects, in particular, which objects to the arrows go from and to okay but we can get that because what we can do let's say we're interested in what's the source of this arrow f comma g well we can do a trick like this we can say let's put our terminal object in here and let's consider this arrow this functor that I was calling source before. So, okay, now we can at least refer to the source of this arrow F as F after source, and similarly with G. But how can we refer to the source of this arrow? Well, the thing is that we can compose f after source 
to give this blue arrow here. We can compose G after source to give this blue arrow here. And now we're looking for the kind of intermediary arrow from one to A times B, which Uh, which is such that if we do it, so we're looking for this intermediary arrow, which if we do P1 after it, we get this blue arrow. And if we do P2 after it, we get this blue arrow on the right. Let's call this intermediary arrow that we're drawing in f after source comma g after source because this blue arrow on the left is f after source and this blue arrow on the right is g after source and this is the unique intermediary arrow which if we do it and then we do p1 we get f after source this left blue arrow and similarly on the right okay um now it's an important and general kind of result about products that this can also be written as f comma g after source because this arrow here also has the property that if we do p1 after it we get f after source and if we do P2 after it, we get G after source, okay? So these two arrows are the same. And this is actually the equation which tells us how to figure out the source objects of this arrow here, F comma G. We have that the source of F comma G is the source of F paired with the source of G, which is just what you'd imagine um these kind of arrows in the categorical products um the source of such an arrow is just the pair of the source of the first arrow and the source of the second arrow um but it's important to realize that this particular equation works in general okay so i could replace this source arrow with any arrow i could re replace two with any object and one with any object and a similar equation would hold. And it's really important for doing kind of um, manipulations in category theory uh, to understand um, this kind of formula because it really turns working with categorical products, which many concepts in category theory are described in terms of, into a kind of algebraic game because we can just always, um, when we have an arrow written to the right of a pair, we can just take it inside the pair, like so. Um, and of course, a similar kind of um, argument goes for targets. We could have written target here instead and thought of this kind of target arrow, which externally refers to the target object of a particular arrow, and we'd have a similar kind of equation. So now we know how to figure out so the equation would be f after target comma g after target equals f comma g after target and so now we know where these kind of arrows go from and go to so we're getting somewhere the only other thing we have to understand is how to compose arrows in these categories okay so now we know what the objects are of this, we know what the arrows are, we know the sources and the targets of the arrows. The final thing we need to know is how to compose the arrows and I'm going to explain that momentarily. Um, let me just say quickly that the basic idea is just shown at the top left, okay, so we just basically compose the arrows component-wise. But the interesting thing I think is to see where this result comes from because now we have this nice kind of uh, language, it really pretty much falls out automatically. I mean, I, I do find it quite remarkable. Like people say that category theory is hard and maybe it is hard to learn it for the first time, but 
I mean, once one knows it, calculations like this become remarkably easy because one pretty much has to say what one wants and just the reasoning pretty much produces it straight away. So what do we want? Well, we want to know uh, how we can compose arrows in A times B. So what are we talking about then? Well, we're interested in three arrows in A times B, which are composable. What is that? Well, that is going to be an arrow from this category three into A times B. We're interested in such an arrow, such a functor, I should say, a functor from three to A times B, because that's going to um, kind of send this before arrow and after arrow and result arrow it's going to point those out in our category and we're going to be able to study them. So let's just suppose that we have some arrow from 3 to A times B. And that's pretty much all we have to do and then we just have to follow through the reasoning. So Okay, so the first question we have to ask is what should we call this arrow? Well, we know that if we do this arrow from 3 to A times B that kind of picks out our triple involving the arrow composition. Um, we know that if we do P1 on it, we'll get an arrow from 3 to A. Well, let's call that arrow T. And we also know that if we do this arrow and then we do P2, then we'll get this arrow from 3 to B. So let's call that arrow T bar. So then it seems like a good idea to call this arrow that we're interested in, that goes into A times B, we'll call it T comma T bar. And now all we need to do is think about how we can refer to the kind of before arrow, after arrow and result arrow by sort of pre-composing this dotted arrow with these arrows from two. OK, because if you remember in the earlier um, picture, we can have this triple of composable arrows and that itself is sort of represented by this functor but if we pre-compose with let's say the before arrow then that will give a, another functor um, which is really sort of just sent just picking out the kind of before arrow involved in that composition okay so now we have this stuff we can figure out what's the structure of this arrow t comma t bar so it's involving three arrows it's going to be involving a sort of before arrow an after arrow and a result arrow okay so what's the before arrow going to look like well that's going to be t comma t bar after before which is t after before comma t bar after before well, OK, that's good. So we know that the sort of before arrow here is just the pair of the before arrow of this triple and the before arrow of this triple. Well, let's give these triples names just so it's easier to think about. Let's call the before arrow F, the after arrow G and the result arrow G after F. And similarly over here, just with bars, OK, when we're talking about stuff going on in the category B. So then we know that the before arrow involved in this triple here in A times B is just going to be T after before comma T bar after before, which is F comma G. So we know that the before arrow involved in our triple is F comma G. And in a similar way, we know that the after arrow involved in our triple is g comma g bar it's just the pairs of the after arrows involved in this sort of um composing triple of a and this kind of composing triple of b okay and so now we can just compute the result we also have using this formula that t comma t bar after result is t result comma t bar results so that's just the pair of the results of these 
composition triples. So, that, so that's just going to be G composed in A after F, comma G bar composed in B after F bar. Okay, so this is just going to be the result. So we have this formula. And notice we've got all of this just from thinking about arrows, because now we can basically talk about everything in category theory in terms of sort of arrows or, well, functors technically uh, between categories in this category of categories. So I think that this is um, quite sort of illuminating. Uh, so I think that this is quite sort of illuminating and there's another thing you can do if you're feeling adventurous. Um, you can basically do a very similar kind of setup for general limits. Okay, so if you think about limits, you can basically start with the definition of a limit and you can work out what the limit of a functor from some index category into cat is. And it's a sort of generalization of this method. Well, I mean, this method. I'm essentially calculating the limits um, of a sort of functor which just uh, goes from some index category with two objects um, and sends one into A and one into B. And I'm working out the limits of that essentially. Um, but you can basically work out the same thing in general. So let's just conclude then um, what we've found out. So we found out that the objects collection of A times B is just the Cartesian product, or can be viewed as the Cartesian product, of the object collection of A and the object collection of B. Similarly with the arrows, the collection of arrows of A times B can be viewed as the Cartesian product of the collection of arrows of A. And the collection of arrows of B. And we have that when we have an arrow F from X to Y in A and an arrow F bar from X bar to Y bar in B. Uh, that corresponds to an arrow f comma g from x comma y to x comma y bar in a times b uh, and we have the arrow composition just works component wise like this and also just for clarity this expression here which i've been talking about note now that we can call this g comma g bar composed after in a times b f comma f bar because we know that the before thing we can call f comma f bar and the after thing we can call g comma g bar so that's nice we we understand about how to take the product of two categories and we understand where the result comes from now so okay so now for something extremely exciting what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how exponential objects work in the category of categories. Now I'd say that mixing exponential objects with the category of categories is sort of like mixing matter with antimatter. You get an enormous kind of explosion of information and it's extremely interesting. So uh, you might recall from earlier videos that we can write this category of graphs like this. And we'd say it's the category of functors from this category here, with two parallel arrows, to the category of sets. Now this is an exponential object. So this whole category of graphs, basically the whole of graph theory in one object, corresponds to an exponential object. Now, the profound thing here is that Yes, this is an object, and it's obviously extremely interesting if you're into graph theory, but there's more to an exponential object than just an object. There's sort of associated arrows and operations which 
like if you really get your mind around them they're just absolutely profound i mean um for example um there's something like this which I'm going to explain later, but I mean, this basically, this evaluation arrow, it sort of acts like an oracle, which tells you pretty much anything about graphs that you're interested in, like what's the um, edge set or vertex set of any given graph? What happens if I apply a given graph homomorphism and then look for the edge set as a result? All of this information, like about all graphs simultaneously, has all been encoded in this little arrow here. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, so we want to understand what exponential objects are in this cat category, okay? So how are we going to do it? Well, we want to start with the definition of an exponential object. So here's the definition. An exponential object is... So for objects A and B, I'm talking in general category theory terms here, but soon we'll specialise to cat. Um, but in general, uh, when you have an object A and an object B, an exponential object consists of this object, which we call B to the power of A, together with this so-called evaluation arrow, which is an arrow that goes from B to the power of A times A, to be all right um, and this setup has to have a special property it has to have the property that for anything kind of similar so for any object t with an arrow f from t times a to b there exists a unique arrow from t to b to the power of a that makes this triangle commute in the sense that if we do E after this F bar here times the identity, we get the same result as F. So we have to have this unique kind of arrow F bar for any F from any object times A to B, um, which makes this triangle commute. Okay, that's the definition of an exponential object in general. Now, in this context, these objects are categories, and we know now what the product of categories is. These arrows are functors. Um, I should probably just recap what this means, okay? So, assuming we know what this, um, what this arrow F bar is, which I'll get onto later, um, how, well, how do we understand what this notation means? f bar times 1a. Well, in general, in cat, um, when we have an object like this, we can always rewrite this kind of arrow using this kind of angle bracket notation as fp1, comma gp2 where these P's are the projections from this product here. Okay, so if you ever get confused, remember that we can always just make this kind of substitution. To be honest, using this, and also this important rule that F comma G after X is FX comma GX, and also this rule that P1 comma P2 is the identity arrow or identity functor in this case, but this is all in general. These sort of laws um, will pretty much get you by when you're dealing with um, composing arrows involving products. Now these are all true in general for general categories uh, with products 
and um, they're very helpful kind of algebraic identities. Anyway, um, let's get on to the fascinating topic of how this actually works. So I'm going to start by just telling you how these different arrows work in this exponential object and then I'm going to go through some kind of intuition about how this works. So I'm going to start by just running through sort of how these different arrows involving this exponential object are set up and then I'm going to go through the definition and then I'm going to go into some sort of intuition about it and hopefully we're really going to understand a lot more about like how to think of category theory from a much higher level using these exponential objects. Okay, so we're going to look at a particular example now, and this is perhaps the most important part of this video, uh, because we're really going to, once we understand basically the nature of a functor from the product of categories to a category, um, a lot of the intuition about um, these exponential objects is going to become apparent. And then I'm actually going to tell you how this evaluation arrow and this F bar arrow work. OK, um, so just before I do, let me just give you a little bit of terminology. Um, this F bar is sometimes called the transpose or the exponential adjoint of this arrow F. And also we may refer to F as the transpose of F bar. OK, and um, you know, for example, if we called this K, we could call this K bar. So we use this kind of bar notation in exponential objects to shift between these two different ways of referring to arrows, essentially operating this isomorphism either way. Um, anyway, let's get on to an example then. Um, so I said I'd write T as this. Um, Actually, I changed my mind. I want to use this notation. So I'm just relabeling the objects and arrow. So I'm now thinking of T. It's basically the same as two, but I'm thinking of it as this category that has two objects named T and T dash and an arrow H from this to this and identity arrows, of course. Um, now, for this example, I'll also use this category A here is a category of a similar structure consisting of objects A and A dash with an arrow F between them. Although I'd like it if you can to try and imagine that this is a general category for this type of construction. So, OK, what do we want to do? We want to understand what it means for there to be a functor F from T times A to B. So the first thing we need to do is understand the structure of T times A. So, OK, up here at the top left, I've drawn a picture of T times A, where this is T and this is A. All right. So the first thing we want to understand, if we want to know about what this functor F from T times A to B is, is what does T times A look like? Well, it basically looks like two copies of A, this copy here, which is sort of prefixed by a T here, and here's another copy of A, but it's sort of prefixed by a T dash here. So we have these two copies of our category A, and we also have some extra arrows in between them. And these arrows are very important, okay? So I've really, I've drawn these two kinds of arrows in two different colors. So there's these blue arrows, um, and they're essentially what happens when you pair an identity arrow of A with an with the with a kind of non-trivial arrow of T. All right, and we have a similar one up here. So this is H comma one A, and this is H comma one A dash. And then there's one more arrow in this picture, which is this green one, which we can just get by composing the red and the blue arrow either way around the square. So if you just forget about this middle arrow for a second, is there a kind of transformation that this picture reminds you of? Hopefully it reminds you of a natural transformation just in the shape of its picture. OK, but 
we're going to see that natural transformations do come about um, very naturally uh, in this kind of construction. So now we understand the structure of T times A, um, what are we going to do next? Well, we're going to think about what happens when we do a functor F from T times A to B. Well, the important thing to realize is about this arrow, H comma F, because this is a general arrow in this category T times A. But we note that we can write it as a composition. We can write it as h comma one after one comma f, or we can write it as one comma f after h comma one. And remember, in general, when we're acting on a func when we're acting with a functor on arrows, we have this rule um, that. say we're acting with a functor g, we have that g, g of f squiggle g squiggle equals g of f squiggle g of g squiggle. In other words, the composition of the images of arrows is the image of the composition of arrows. So since we know that F here is a functor, we know that it must satisfy that law. And so this observation about these two ways around the square boil down to this kind of equation here. And it's basically the same observation just when we're doing the functor F on those arrows. So we know that for every arrow F from A to A dash, and every arrow h in t from t to t dash, we have this equation holding that f of h comma one after f of one comma f equals f of h comma f equals f of one comma f after f of h comma one. All right, so we're just using two different kind of rules to get this equation. One of them is how we compose arrows in these kind of products of categories and the other one is this kind of law of composing arrows and the functors okay um so what well basically we can see the kind of natural transformation that we're looking for kind of lurking underneath this so let me just say briefly how this works and then I'll go into the details and make it more explicit, but basically, but basically what we're going to do is cook up a natural transformation, which we can call eta superscript h. Now that h is really just part of the name of this. It doesn't really have any sort of meaning, um, but we can then think of this as E to H A dash the sort of A dash component of this natural transformation and we can think of this as E to H A. Now um, I realize at this point this is a bit cryptic but uh, I'm going to sort of flesh this out a lot more but Basically, the idea is that we're thinking of this functor as sending this product of these two categories into B. And now what we can do is we can think, well, how about if we think about two functors? One functor which sends this red stuff on the left into B. So that's essentially like a functor from A to B and another functor that sends this red stuff on the right into B. So that's like another functor from A to B. And now these kind of horizontal blue arrows can be thought of as a natural transformation 
from this functor to this functor. And these kind of green arrows, these non-trivial ones, can be obtained by composing sort of arrows within these red arrows within these sort of particular copies um, of our category A, uh, together with these natural transformation uh, components. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And um, okay, just to carry on, and since I'm getting ahead of myself, I might as well carry on, I'll go back and flesh this out. But basically, but I mean, basically for every T, in here, uh, we have a copy of the category A kind of indexed with a T. So we've got um, sort of, we think of this almost like T times A, and this is like T dash times A. So we have these different T times A, T dash times A, maybe there's a T dash dash times A, these different copies of A in this category here. And um, when we do this functor F, um, each of those copies gets sent into B. So we can think that there's a particular functor um, sending each sort of copy of A into B. And um, what this F bar does is it actually extracts those functors and then sort of saves them in this functor category. So that's basically the way F bar works on objects. And then the way that F bar works on arrows H of T is it sort of extracts these natural transformations and those become arrows between objects within our functor category. OK, so I know that's all like I'm going way too fast, but let me um, now slow down and we'll think about this in more detail. OK, so we're going to back right up and we're going to look at an interesting question, which is we see that there are these copies of A in this kind of category T times A, but how can we refer to them? Um, and this picture is basically the answer. So what's going on here? Well, we have this arrow, which is just the identity arrow, or if you like the identity functor from category A to category A, but this arrow is more interesting. Okay, so if we compose these two, we get what's sometimes called a constant arrow. So let's have a look at this part of it to begin with. What's this? Exclamation mark A. Well, that's the unique arrow which goes from A to the terminal object. And then after we do that, we do this arrow T, which is picking an object T. So this composition here is called a constant arrow because whatever information we have, whatever other arrows we're sort of feeding into this, that information kind of gets lost when we go to the terminal object. And then whatever we had before, it doesn't really matter. The result is always going to be T, picking out this object of T. Okay, so that's a constant arrow. And what we do then is we sort of, we have this product of A times T with its projections P1 and P2 into T and A. And when we just take this unique intermediary arrow, so we could call this arrow T after exclamation mark A, comma 1A. And what it's essentially doing is it's taking some stuff in our category A and sending it to one of these copies of A inside T times A. Which copy? Well, that depends on which object T we pick. If we pick T, we get this copy. If we pick T dash, we get this copy. Um, just an interesting aside, um, this kind of dotted arrow here is what's known as a monomorphism. So a monomorphism is a special kind of arrow in a category which sort of works, well, in the category of sets, the monomorphisms are injective functions. They're just sort of a one-to-one. -one. They don't they don't make anything collide. And I mean, in set theory, when you're doing these kind of one-to-one -one, uh, functions, you're essentially just sort of selecting a subset. And so another word for monomorphism is sub-object. 
and a monomorphism is defined in general, in a general category, an arrow M is a monomorphism when for any sort of pair of incoming parallel arrows into the source of M, we have that whenever MX equals MY, we have X equals Y, okay? And like I say, monomorphisms basically, we can think of them as sort of picking out parts of objects. And we see that this intuition is working well for us here because we have a sort of category A, and then this arrow here is sort of sending that category into one of these copies of it in T times A, uh, in a way that it's, you know, one-to-one -one on the objects and the arrows. Um, just for those who have encountered them, this is also, it's even more special. It's, it's a special kind of arrow called a graph. And if you think about how it goes from A to A times T, and you think about the graphs that you draw, uh, in the Cartesian um, coordinate system and so on, that might make some sense to you, but I'm getting off topic. So the point is that this arrow here is really sending a copy of A into T times A, and we can choose which copy we're picking by varying the kind of object of T that we're using inside this arrow, okay? So, okay. We have this functor f that sends all of t times a to b. Okay, so we know that there are these copies of a inside t times a. And we know that there's this kind of functor which sends all of t times a to b. So it makes sense then to think about how this functor f operates on one of these copies of a inside t times a. And we can formalize that kind of thinking with this picture here. So we've just got our old diagram and we've added a couple of arrows on. So basically, we have this arrow here, which essentially picks out one of our copies of A inside... Oh, fuck. That should be... T times A. Okay, my apologies, that should always have been T times A over there, um, because that's the order we're working with. Anyway, um, so we have this arrow here, which sort of picks out a copy of A inside T times A. And then if we do F after that, that composition, so F after T exclamation mark A comma 1, let's give that a name. Let's call it F T comma blank. And notice that that's going to be a functor from A to B. So this is the kind of functor which sends uh, one of these copies of A inside T times A to B. Okay. And it turns out that these blue arrows are going to be natural trans... So it turns out then that these blue arrows are going to be components of natural transformations between such functors. Okay. Um, but firstly, let's try and understand how this ft, blank actually works. So it's a functor from A to B. So what happens when we feed in some object A? Okay, so let's see explicitly then how this ft, blank functor works. So what we're going to do for a start, we want to know how it works on objects. So we're going to pick an object of A using a functor from the terminal object and then just compose it with ft, blank. And this is the result. So I think it's very nice that we kind of get all this sort of mechanically just by composing arrows. So we have the ft comma blank a by definition is f after t exclamation mark a comma identity of a all after a now remember when we're composing one of these bracket things after something we can just take that something inside the brackets so we then have that this equals t exclamation mark a a comma 1a a 
Well, we know that that right part is just going to be A. But what about this left part? What's going on here? Well, first we're going along A, and then we're going along this arrow into the terminal object. So the result is actually just T, okay? Because this kind of part sort of evaporates and we're just left with f of t comma a, which really suits the notation, doesn't it? I mean, that's why it's called f t comma blank. Really, we can think of this as a sort of uh, functor, which sends a to b, um, and it operates just like this one does, just with a particular object t held fixed, okay, which picks out one of these copies, and we're talking about how F kind of works on that copy okay so maybe T or T dash or whatever um, so that all sort of fits with our intuition now in a similar way we want to know how this functor works on arrows okay because it's a functor from A to B we figured out how it works on objects of A how does it work on an arrow of A well let's just represent an arrow like so, and then we can just go through the math again, composing f t comma blank after f to find out what kind of arrow of b we get. And here's what we get. We get f t comma blank after f is by definition f after t exclamation mark a comma identity of a all after f. We take the f inside um, and then we want to evaluate this. So we can see this right hand side part here is just going to be F there. But this part's a bit more tricky. It's T exclamation mark A after F. So we want to compose these arrows along here. So how are we going to do this? Well, this is quite interesting. So F here is picking out an arrow of A. And then this functor here is sending everything in A to the terminal object. So it'll send all the arrows in A to this arrow uh, of our single object in this category here, which if you remember is called one star. That's the, the only object in this category is called star and its arrow, its identity arrow is called one star. And so doing exclamation mark A after F is just going to pick out this arrow one star. So it's essentially just referring to the identity arrow of the only object in this category. So we see that this T exclamation mark A F T after exclamation mark A after F is equal to T after one star. What is that? Well, that's this functor T operating on this identity arrow of this only object in here. So that's going to become the identity arrow of t. So we have that t after one star is equal to the identity arrow of t. And so finally we have that concluding we have that f t comma blank of a is f t of a and f t comma blank of f is f of one t comma f. Can you see that anywhere? It's here, right? So we can now call this F t comma blank operating on F. And we can call this F t dash comma blank operating on F. And maybe now you can see a bit more um, why we're considering this natural transformation going on. So, okay, after all that thought, we finally can sort of re-express this and see that the point of all this is that ft comma blank is a functor from A to B. That's essentially the way that this F works on this copy of A in here. And ft dash comma blank is similarly 
a functor from A to B. The way that A, the way that F works on this copy of A here. So the point of all this is that this E to H here is actually a natural transformation from F T comma blank to F T dash comma blank. So how are we to understand this? Well, what's E to H? Well, we define E to H as having its eighth component equal to F of H comma one A. So essentially, if we think about these blue arrows, which kind of go between copies of A in T times A, and we think about how F operates on those, it essentially changes that family of arrows in T times A into a natural transformation, or we can think of it as a natural transformation because it's defined, the eighth component of E to H is defined as the kind of blue arrow, which is what happens when you keep your object A constant, but you do this H operation, but then you're sort of lifting this with this functor F. Okay, so the real point of all this is that if we do our functor F on this kind of square here, we get this exact square here, okay? So we see that basically what happens to these blue arrows when we do F, they become these red arrows and we can view um, each of these red arrows, these sort of images of our blue arrows uh, under this functor F as forming this family of arrows which constitutes a natural transformation from FT comma blank to FT dash comma blank. So this is really the fundamental picture of what's going on. Um, so essentially uh, we can view a functor F from T times A to B as um, a sort of a load of functors, um, one from sort of T times A and one from T dash times A and T dash dash times A and so on. Um, the All these sort of functors from A to B with all of these natural transformations between them, which are sort of corresponding to the arrows of this category T. Okay, so for every ob arrow H from an object of T to an object of T, we have one of these natural transformations E to H, or we can consider it to be a natural transformation from E to T comma blank to E to T dash comma blank. And so this is really the fundamental picture. Now, there's just one more thing to say, I suppose, which is what about this um, extra arrow? You see, all the arrows in this picture at the bottom right are all arrows from here, um, which have one of their components as an identity arrow, okay? Um, but then there's also this extra sort of non-trivial arrow here. So what happens to that? Well, we can just get that by composing around this naturality square. So we could express um, f of h comma f as f of t dash comma blank of f after e to h of a, for example. So it'd be this arrow like this, okay? Now, now so now we have a new kind of intuition about what it means for there to be a functor from t times a to b. We can think of it as a collection of functors, um, a functor from a to b for every object of t, and for every arrow of t, there's a corresponding kind of natural transformation um, between these functors from a to b, and the sort of non-trivial arrows uh, in T times A get lifted under this functor in a way we can understand just by composing the kind of bits that came from these copies of A with these kind of components of the natural transformations. So we have this new kind of view. Now, basically, what the exponential object does is it sort of formalizes this intuition. 
it basically extracts um, out these particular functors, ft comma blank and ft dash comma blank. They become objects in this functor category. The eta thing becomes a well, that's a natural transformation that becomes a kind of arrow in our functor category. And um, then what this E does is it essentially just sort of evaluates that stuff and it gives us the same results as doing F. So how precisely does this F bar work? So remember, this is the transpose of F. So we have this arrow F from T times A to B, this functor, and um, by the magic of exponential objects, this corresponds to this unique arrow from T to our functor category. So how does it work? Well, it sends an object T to this functor FT comma blank. And that makes sense, right? Because we're taking uh, an object of T and then we've seen that that corresponds to a functor FT comma blank from this sort of copy of A to B. So indeed we are sending an object T of this category T to a functor from A to B. So that makes sense. Okay, but what does this F bar do to arrows? Well, if we have an arrow H in T, so let's say an arrow H from T to T bar, we've seen in this kind of new view of this functor here that for such an arrow, we can get this natural transformation, E to H, which is a natural transformation from ft comma blank to ft dash comma blank with components defined like this. So the eighth component of this natural transformation is f of h comma 1a, sort of f acting on these blue arrows, okay? Um, and so all that this f bar does then, it sends this arrow h in t to this natural transformation, e to h. So we can see immediately that the um, sort of so the uh, source and target um, match up properly because indeed, if um, H is an arrow from T to T dash, then E to H is a natural transformation from F of T comma blank to F of T dash comma blank. By the way, we can see the naturality of eta um, just from this stuff here. OK, um, so that's great. We understand now part of the exponential object. The only other thing to say is how this evaluation arrow works. Um, and I think this is the most profound part of the exponential object, although it's not going to be too difficult for us to understand. Now we've built up all this intuition. So now, finally, I'll tell you how this evaluation arrow works. OK, so what do we have here? It's it's an arrow which goes from B to the power of A times A to B. All right. So you can sort of think of this is kind of like a map and this is like the input and this like evaluates the map. But let's be more precise. OK, so there are two kinds of things in this category, objects and arrows. So I've got to tell you how this E here works on the objects and works on the arrows. So what's an object of b to the power of a times a? Well, that's going to be a functor g from a to b paired with an object a of this category a. And what happens to that when we apply this evaluator functor? Well, all it does is it applies this functor g to this object a. So we simply get g of a, all right? Um, so that's pretty simple. How does it work on arrows? Now this takes a little more getting your head around. Um, so, okay, what's an arrow in b to the power of a times a? Well, it's a pair of arrows. An arrow of b to the power of a, that's a natural transformation beta from a functor g to a functor h, and also, an arrow f of this category a, let's say an arrow that goes from object a to object a dash. 
So what does this evaluator do? Well, it outputs this arrow here, H of F after beta of A, okay? And we can think of that basically as a kind of diagonal of one of these naturality squares, okay? Because now we're going to get the understanding of exactly how this exponential object works, okay? So firstly, let's just um, step back and think about objects, okay? So we want to show now, now I've told you what F bar is and what E is, we want to show that this diagram commutes, okay? So these are all functors which do stuff to objects and do stuff to arrows. So we have to sort of show that we get the same objects going either way around this triangle and we get the same arrow. So let's start with objects. So if we start up here with a object T in category T and an object A in category A, and we do this F here, our result is gonna be F of T of A. Let's write that in. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but what about if we go around this way? Well, we know that this arrow here is going to leave this A alone, but it's going to change this T here into F of T comma blank. And so what we're gonna be left with is G is equal to F T comma blank and A. And then when we do this evaluator, we get G of A, which is G, we get G of A, which is F T comma blank of A, which is F T A. So tick, it works on objects, okay? Now we have to show that this kind of triangle commutes when we're working with arrows as well. So what's an arrow in here? Well, we could call such an arrow H comma F. And when we do this functor, we'll get F of H comma F. That'll be the result of doing this functor F on that arrow of T times A. Now we have to think about what happens when we go this way around the triangle. So what's H comma F going to become when we apply this kind of functor? Well, it's going to leave F alone because this functor here doesn't do anything to the stuff in A, but it is gonna change H. So what we're gonna get is we're gonna get eta of H comma F. Now, what happens when we do the evaluator functor? Well, what do we have here? I'm using two different pieces of terminology for the same thing, okay? So I'm writing F of T comma blank. That's my kind of notation, which sort of came from using this F bar, but I'm also using this general notation for functors and natural transformations for my general description of how this evaluator works. So we can just sort of make sure we know what we're talking about. We'll also call this G of A. This is also called beta of A. This is also called H of A. This is G of A dash. beta of A dash and H of A dash. So we know that the result of, so here, um, 
when we've already done this arrow, what do we have to do our evaluator on? Well, we're going to be doing it on a kind of pair of arrows like this in this category. In particular, the arrows that we're going to be working with are going to be, in particular, the arrows we're going to be doing this evaluator on are going to be um, like this. We're going to have this beta is going to be this eta h from f of t comma blank to f of t dash comma blank, and the f is going to stay in f, okay? And so once we do this, the result that we're going to get is h of f after beta of a, which is which is just f of t dash comma blank after eta of h of a. And that is precisely this arrow here, which we could also call f of h comma f. So everything matches up. OK, so let's just go through this again, because this um, argument about the arrows is a little bit complicated. So here's the evaluator arrow. The way it works on general in general is that for an arrow beta from a functor G to a functor H and an arrow F, it outputs H of F after beta of A. All right. But we want to consider what happens when we do this evaluator arrow after f bar times 1a. Now f bar times 1a changes h comma f into e to h comma f, where e to h has components like this. And now when we do the evaluator arrow, we take this pair of arrows from you know, an arrow from here and an arrow from here. So an E to H and an F. And they get changed to become F of T dash comma blank after E to H of A. And that exactly corresponds to this diagonal. And I've already said that this diagram here is basically what we get if we take this diagram here and apply F. So this diagonal is exactly F of H comma F, which is just the same as what we get if we apply the functor F to H comma F. So that's it. Now we understand how exponential objects work in the category of categories. It's quite profound stuff. Okay, why is it profound? Well, how about we consider a particular case of this? So how about we consider the case where t equals two and a is our kind of category of two parallel arrows, the one that we used for making graphs. And let's suppose that b is equal to the category set. Okay. So let me just talk through what's going on in this case. All right. Um, so this functor f from t times a to b, that's going to be, I mean, t here has two objects, okay? So if we fix one of those objects, we get a copy of 
A, and we can think about how F works on that copy of A. And then we're just going to have a functor from this category of two parallel arrows to set. So that's going to be a graph. OK, so um, so if we set A to be this category of two arrows, then basically we can consider two, T times A to be a sort of couple of copies of this category with some arrows between them, rather like this diagram here, OK? And then we can consider a functor F to be something that sends the first copy of A associated with T uh, to set. So that would be making a graph because it would be a functor from this to set. And similarly, there'd be a graph for T dash, which also sends this to set. And then this arrow H, we can consider to be a kind of natural transformation from that first functor to that second functor, just like this kind of thing. So we can really think of this functor F from T times A to B uh, in this case as a kind of graph homomorphism, okay? It's a natural transformation from the um, graph represented by how this functor works um, on kind of T times A, I mean, um, the object T, to the graph represented by T dash times A, okay? Um, so we understand that this kind of F here is really a picture of this natural transformation. It's, it's not a natural transformation, uh, but it's a sort of picture of it because it's all, it's not just picturing like how the, um, how the sort of um, components of the arrows work. It's also picturing the kind of source of that natural transformation, the functor it starts from and the target, the functor it finishes from, and also like some extra things like these kind of arrows. Um, so that's all quite interesting. And then how does the exponential object work in this context then? Well, what it does, essentially this F bar um, really extracts um, these functors. So it extracts this functor, which works, I mean, we could call it FT comma blank, um, this functor, which sort of sends um, this t here times this to set um, and that will become an object in our functor category and then also the other graph the other kind of functor from kind of t dash times this to set also um, gets stored as a graph when we do this f bar and then the really interesting thing is how this evaluation arrow works, okay? So I've already argued through um, why this diagram commutes. So let me just now talk in generality, well, I'm talking about graphs, but I mean, let me just talk generally about in this case, how this evaluation arrow works, okay? So what does it work on in this context? Well, we have a graph, okay? So that's gonna be a functor from this category to set and it's going to be paired with an object of this category so that would really be either representing the the edges or the vertices of our graph depending on whether we're talking about the top or bottom object in this picture okay and then what does this evaluation arrow do well it really gives us the either the edge set or the vertex set of our graph, okay? So we have a graph in our left hand, we have in our right hand, either this or this, which says that we're talking about edges or vertices. And when we evaluate, we get either the edge set or the vertex set of our graph. That's what G of A would be, okay? Um, so to make this more concrete, we could call these objects um, E and V. And I could say when A equals E, then of course GE is going to be the edge set of this graph. All right. Um, so that's good. And so already we can see that this evaluation arrow is quite profound, okay, because we can give it any graph 
and then we can find out what the edge set or the vertex set of that graph is. But what's much more profound is how this evaluator arrow works, how this evaluator functor works on arrows, okay? So what's it do to arrows? Well, if we give it a natural transformation beta from graph G to graph H, and also an arrow F from A to A dash, so let me just do a bit of relabeling. Let's just imagine that that's an arrow S from E to V, since we're talking about graphs. So that's kind of like finding the um, the source vertex of a particular edge. Okay. Um, well, in that case, when we do this evaluator, what happens? Well, we get this. Okay. So what's this doing? Well, it's It's applying a graph transformation. So we're going from, let's say, this graph here, G, to this graph here, H, using this graph homomorphism beta. And then it's doing H of F, which in our context, if F is the source thing, it's giving us the source of a particular edge. OK, so what this is really doing in this context, you can think of at least one example would be, um, you know, when we load the right kind of arrow into our evaluator, um, we can be taking a edge set. We can get a function that goes from the edge set of G and then it sees how that edge set gets mapped under this natural transformation. And then that gives you some edges in H and then it finds the source vertex of that edge. OK, so this is really amazing because all of this stuff is getting done by one arrow. OK, so with the appropriate inputs, um, this kind of evaluator can pretty much well, it can tell us most things we want to know about graphs. OK, so, you know, what happens? If I do this particular graph transformation um, from one graph to another, and then I want to find the source vertex of the resulting thing. Well, that's what this evaluator does. If we put in this beta and this F equals S here. OK, um, so this is all quite remarkable. And I mean, when you think that this evaluator not only does it is it able to tell you for any graph like what is its edge set and what is its vertex set it's also able to essentially give you a function to be able to work out the source of any edge the target of any edge um any graph transformation any uh, um graph homomorphism natural transformation like that um, and, and any kind of composition of a graph and any composition of a graph homomorphism and a process of finding source or target vertices. Um, that's really quite amazing, isn't it? That all of that is done by just one arrow. I mean, if um, this is the kind of universe of graphs, then this is sort of like an oracle that can tell you anything you want to know about graphs. And it's just one arrow. OK, so this is really the kind of um, profound thing about these functor categories. Um, they let you kind of um, rise up a level of abstraction, you know, from the specific to the general. And that's really what exponential objects do for one. I mean, um, a bit of intuition about exponential objects in general, um, at least my thinking on it, um, I, I try and draw parallels uh, between um, 
the real world and category theory and i mean sometimes it's fuzzy because you know there's a lot of stuff in the real world that looks like stuff that's going on in category theory okay so one of the things we have in the real world are experts okay so um think about for example someone who's an expert in applying chemicals to crops and agronomists or something um you could say that that's a kind of um entity in the world you know like an object um which inside it kind of encapsulates all this information about kind of maps from chemicals to plants okay and so in a sense um they're acting sort of like an exponential object they're a kind of objectification of a load of relationships so maybe like the perfect agronomist is like an exponential object like um plants to the power of chemicals or something i know it's a bit vague and almost certainly incorrect in in detail but i, I find this kind of intuition helps me at least um and so in this context we see that like the category of graphs is really just the um sort of objectification of the relationships in in cat between this kind of um category here and set and what this evaluator arrow does essentially it acts as a kind of oracle that tells us all about how we can sort of evaluate this functor in different ways and all of this sort of infinite amount of information about you know what happens what graphs have what edge sets and what vertex sets and what edges connect with what uh vertices and what kind of graph homomorphisms are and how they all work is all encoded in this evaluator arrow okay so i just wanted to point out a couple of kind of miscellaneous tricks that one can do with exponential objects and these are pretty useful um in lots of the kind of proofs and things that come up um so it's just good to know about them okay one of them is about how we can think about this evaluation arrow because if we understand how to transpose arrows that really gives us a way to think about this evaluation arrow a different kind of way to think about it so the um observation that we want to make then is that this triangle in white here commutes okay so this is just the identity arrow and these are just evaluation arrows and these are the same objects okay um but then if you think about this let's say we sort of try to compute the transpose of this arrow e a comma b well we'd call that transpose e a comma b transpose and that's the unique arrow um from b to the power of a to b to the power of a which if we multiply it by identity of a uh, it makes this diagram commute so we see then that this um transpose of e to the a comma b is exactly just the identity of b to the power of a so the evaluation arrow is the unique arrow that's transpose is the identity of b to the power of a the other thing i want to show you is a sort of trick so often when you're dealing with the kind of algebra of exponential objects you have this kind of situation where you have one kind of ordinary arrow like this f here which is an arrow from c to b and then another arrow which is like something transposed okay so this is the transpose of h where h would be an arrow from b times a to t okay so how do we compute this h transpose after f how can we turn that into something meaningful well the important formula is this one okay so this is often very helpful it is that h transpose after f equals 
H after F times 1A all transposed. So this is very useful because then, for example, you could just transpose all this again to get rid of this over bar here, and then you've got ordinary arrows, okay? Um, so once you've got everything on the same kind of order, so it's either all transposed or not all trans or all not transposed, then you can work with your arrows more easily. So this is a very useful kind of transformation to be able to make, but how do we justify it? How do we justify this formula? Well, the idea is that we take this kind of diagram here and we multiply it all by A. Okay, so um, these objects become the objects times A, these arrows become these arrows times identity of A, and then we look at, oh look, this last arrow is t to the power of a times a. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we did an evaluation on that? Then we can get this arrow that goes to t. So we do that, and then we notice, oh look, um, this after this is just h. So then we have that going all the way along this line on the left here it is just h after f times ida. So f so h after f times ida equals e after the composition of these two which is h bar after f all times 1a but then hang on we're writing we have this so why don't we just get the expression for the transpose of this directly why don't we just think about how this interacts uh, with our exponential object here. So we know that we can write this as e after this stuff transpose times the identity. So we can write this as e after this stuff transpose times the identity. But this is supposed to be the unique way that we can write this as e after something times the identity. So that means that this thing here h after f times ida all transposed has to equal h transpose after f and that's the formula that we wanted.